Welcome to Let's Play Every Day, your daily source for deep dives on the sports talkers of the day. And now, here's your host, Tim McNabb. Good morning, everybody, and welcome once again to Let's Play Every Day. My name is Tim McNiff, and it's my honor to welcome some esteemed panelists from the Twin Cities sports, business, whatever communities. They're here to talk about the key sports plays of the day. They're going to take them down one by one. But first, by any chance, did you wake up this morning? And suddenly find yourself in need of a custom Ooh, patch wow. cap or perhaps a knit hat and you just didn't know what to do? Oh, have I got you covered, friend. You're in the right place. Northern Lids is not only the official hat of Let's Play Every Day. They offer the finest line of custom patch caps and knits hats. And all you have to do is go to northernlids.com and tell them that Tim sent you. Looking nice. good, Timmy. Looking I love good, that. Yes. All right. And with <laughs> that, it's my pleasure to welcome in. Jesse Pierce, it seems like at least a week since Jesse's been here, but it's only been five days. So there you go. Nice to have you with us uh, once again. Uh, Jesse, she, of course, creates content for NHL.com, Min Hockey Journal, USA Hockey, and your main occupation. And I don't begrudge you this one at all, trying to keep track of Alexis Pearson on the Bar Down Beauties <laughs> podcast. It's a hard that one. Is, That's the hardest task I have, I think. Hardest job easily. That in itself is a full-time job, but you deal with kids, so you should be used to. True. That's very yeah. true. <laughs> and then, of course, Kevin Gord. Kevin Gord, sports reporter for Bally Sports North, track announcer, tipster at Canterbury Park, and, of course, the man with the plan when it comes to It's Gorgomatic. You guys were just talking before we went live, and your next season, your 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 next season really begins – Tomorrow. Talk about that. They're dropping the puck. Yeah, media day for both Jesse and I tomorrow over at Tria Rank. It's a labor of love for, for both of us. We love being at the rank, love being around the guys. We didn't get to really do that last year. We got to be at the rink a couple times, but watching from afar. And it sounds like, uh, as far as I know, in my communication with the folks from Valley Sports and from the Wild, is we're going to be able to talk to the guys and be around the guys. And it's just going to feel a lot more like a hockey season, Jess, right? Oh, absolutely. I cannot wait. I mean, I think we talked about that quite a bit, belabored it a little bit, but it is. It's where you kind of start to build those relationships. There's so many new faces with this Minnesota Wild organization that it'll be nice to actually get to see their faces and have them see ours as well this year. Well, we're going to get into that a little bit uh, a little bit later on, but uh, much like the days after a good Thanksgiving Day meal, we're still picking up the bones of what transpired over this weekend, the leftovers, one where people keep stepping up and taking the blame for what happened. Let's start with the Vikings, where a seemingly kinder, gentler Mike Zimmer, who when asked on Monday about kicker Greg Joseph's late game miss said, and I quote, lots of kickers miss field goals, so let's give the kid a break, said Blair <laughs> Walsh, Daniel Carlson, and Dan Bailey in unison. Excuse me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, KG, is this coach who has learned from hard lessons in the past mistakes? Or is it a guy who just spent the night checking the waiver wire and figured out there's nobody better out there than uh, Greg Joseph? Combination of both probably, but the Daniel Carlson thing probably fresh in his mind, right? Young kicker, all the potential in the world, one bad game and and jettisoned off uh, to the waiver wire where the Raiders have reaped the benefits since. This guy is an all-pro. He's a stud. And I think Mike Zimmer might have learned from that. To me, though, it, it reeks of a coach trying to take the light away from a lot of the mistakes this team has made through two weeks and for a head coach that's known to be a great defensive mind and to have some pretty good weapons on defense, they've given up 61 points in two games. So the more they're talking about the kicker, the less they're talking about his defense. <laughs> and now here comes Russell Wilson and the high flying Seattle super chickens. And so, yeah, Mike Zimmer's probably more than happy to play the charade game with the kicker talk and not have to talk about his defense, which has been shredded in back-to-back -back weeks. Kevin Gorg, I just went and scratched one of my questions down there because you went through there and you just you just answered that one right there for me. So uh, nicely done, because I've been wondering, too, listen to that yesterday. Yeah, can he afford to be that nice? Because nobody's talking about his clock management, the squib kick at the end of the first half or his clock management down the end. Uh, Jesse, Zim, in his endless search for a man who can actually make a kick when it counts, is still paying, as Kevin said, for that yes. Daniel Carlson mistake two games into his rookie year. How do you think the Zimmer defense of his kicker, which only echoes what uh, Joseph's teammates said 
about him a day earlier. How do you think that will play in the Vikings locker room? I mean, I think it's funny. I had tweeted about this yesterday, and my buddy Nate Wells said, Daniel Carlson was cut so Greg Joseph could fly. And uh, panelist Heather Rule said, Daniel Carlson would like a word, because of course it is. It's completely opposite of what you've seen from Coach Zimmer. Um, I think it, though, might be a little bit of a credit to how he's grown as a head coach, too, as well, right? Like, I think he's maybe recognized, doesn't do me any good. I mean, not that he's not throwing players under the bus, Kirk Cousins, but uh, certainly to, yeah, maybe not coddle, but take a softer, gentler approach, as you had suggested um, with these clickers. And as you'd mentioned earlier, there's not much else out there. So you're kind of stuck with what you got. No discredit to Greg Joseph. Not to mention, don't forget, he played phenomenally for them in week one, too. So it wouldn't be quite fair to say, OK, now we're done with you after there was a great first week. And, you know, it's it is what it is at this point, I think. I think you're right. Uh, for his part, Greg Joseph, he did surface yesterday, was not made available to the media on Sunday. He came to a Zoom yesterday wearing a cap. Did you guys see the cap he was wearing? Was it Northern Lids? Was it Northern Lids? Yeah, that would be my it question. It should have been Northern Lids, but it was <laughs> not. Uh, he had a cap that had a patch on it. It said, kindness, pass it on. And I was like, is nobody really asking him a question about the, the cap? You know, did one of your teammates give that to you? Did you find that on your own? So, um, so he said, and I quote, that's on me, which I think loosely translates into it's my fault. Uh, so Kevin, he also, when asked about it said, yeah, I don't really look at social media. Probably a good idea. Not for just where he's concerned, but maybe all pro athletes. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you can, avoid it. If you're a, any type of athlete that's on a big stage, whether you're a college or pro athlete, it's it's pretty vicious. And, you know, there's a lot of emotion involved. And I think all these players and teams want fans to have the passion for the game. Sometimes it gets to be a little too much, though, and especially on social media where things can get a little hateful. Uh, kindness is a good message. Staying off social media probably for a young guy like that is good. And back to Jesse's point, I mean – this guy was awesome at Cincy, and throughout most of that game against Arizona, he was really good. He made some big kicks. It's unfortunate because it's like the, the golfer that hasn't yet got over the hump and has that four-foot birdie putt on 18 to seal the deal. And even though he's made 25-footers all the way through the back nine to get into this position, when everything's on the table and you've got to make that four-footer, players have talked about that pressure, whether it's guys in the PGA Tour, guys that are kickers, in the National Football League, it's a different animal. And it's a learning experience for a young kicker. And I think if we've learned anything here in Minnesota with kickers, and if you're Mike Zimmer all the way through our fan base, is if you jump to judgment, if you crucify a guy for one bad mistake, they can still be a, a great kicker in this league down the road for somebody else. And that's the Daniel Carlson lesson that we all need to remember. And this kid is young. He's still learning his craft. And he'll be better for having gone through what he went through on Sunday. Uh, KG, the, the miss on Sunday and thinking about the litany of all the Vikings misses that we all painfully know, it had me going to Google and, and doing my research on one Fred Cox. And I put this on uh, the end of yesterday's program that, you know, in his first year, he was exactly 50%. He <laughs> was like 13 for 26 um, with the longest of 46 yards kept his job for the next 14 seasons. He was there for 15 years, including after going 0-2 in Super Bowl. So kicking never really the Minnesota Vikings thing, uh, but uh, he managed to keep that job and they still won a lot of football games. Is there a lesson we learned in that, Jesse? I mean, I think so. Like you had just mentioned, the stakes happen. Things are going to happen. Gary Anderson didn't miss a field goal all year, right? I mean, that's the first time I think I saw my dad cry and take off his Vikings jersey. It was a very painful memory for me in my childhood as is his. Um, you know, I think it's similar to how Kevin related it to golf, right? You need to make some of those putts. I would relate it to, surprise, surprise, hockey and a hockey goalie. He could stand on his head and make save after save and still let in the game-winning goal and the red light goes off behind him and the fans are booing because he lost in the game. I mean, kickers have all of that pressure to win a game or to lose a game. And unfortunately, with that pressure comes a lot of the fan consensus of, okay, now we hate him. But now we love him because he won it for us. And now we hate him again. And it's, I mean, it's tough. It's a tough position to play. I think maybe that's also, again, going back to Zimmer being softer and kinder. Maybe he recognizes that, this is a mental component to the game and he needs to kind of help him work through this. So Greg Joseph doesn't get down on himself. Um, you know, so I think again, at the end of the day, let's wash away week two as a whole kicking and everything and move forward into week three. And hopefully it's much better for Greg Joseph and the bikes.
I'm going to credit you for keeping your line of thought. You like that? Yeah, yeah. You, pro. You're just, you're just nice locked little, in pro, right? Nice little kick to the swing, and she's she's gone back to sleep. So. <laughs> <laughs> what a mom. <laughs> she's okay. Yeah, she's you good. Didn't nudge even with the foot while you're talking. That was, <laughs> that's... That was impressive right there. That's what moms do, right? <laughs> Kevin Gorg, Adam Thielen did not step up and take the blame for Sunday's loss. He bucking the trend there. But he did say that the biggest thing was that as a team, we've got to stick together. How much easier is it for the Vikings to adopt that mantra and make that happen when this situation happens in week two versus week 15 when you're looking at, am I getting a playoff check or not? Yeah, a lot easier right now in September, and it's a 17-game schedule. It's a grind. So if you're Adam Thielen and the Vikings, I think you can stay on the same page rather easily right now, knowing that you put out uh, two games where you could have won both, and both were on the road. You get to come home. Uh, you hope that's going to be some sort of remedy. You get to be around your family a little bit more this week. Uh, a lot of players like Adam have young kids at home. So there are some silver linings for sure, but you know, you and I talked about this on It's Gorgomatic. Uh, they're 0-2. They're coming home to play Seattle and Cleveland, who are both likely going to be playoff teams. Zimmer's 0-5 in his career against the, the Super Chicken. So, I mean, you know, you can take some respite in that. You're still a home underdog. And if you lose this week, now you're 0-3 facing Cleveland and Stefanski, who you know want to come in here and spoil the party. And you've got this November schedule that might be the hardest schedule throughout the National Football League. So you hate to say must win in September. This is as close to must win as it gets because I just don't think you're going to start 0-3, even with 14 more games, and still make the playoffs. And the one thing we learned in the last 24 hours is you better not bury Aaron Rodgers and the, and the Packers just yet. Well, we better learn from last year's 0-4 start. <laughs> hard to make the playoffs when you dig your – unless you're the Minnesota Lynx – you know, it's hard to make right. the playoffs when you start 0-4. Uh, <laughs> All right. You would think that it would be a whole lot easier to celebrate a win and not really have anything to apologize for when your team goes on the road and beats their opponents 30-zip the way the Gophers did to the Buffs in Boulder. But guess what? You'd be wrong. Late in the half, the Gophers failed to manage the clock and attempt a field goal because head coach P.J. Fleck received some faulty intel from the Pac-12 officiating crew. But afterward, P.J. said, it was my fault because he said he should have double and triple checked and he apologized for his team to his team for the clock mismanagement. Jesse, how much is it? How much easier is it to stand in front of a group of your players and apologize for your mistakes when you're riding a 30 to nothing win? I mean, everything's easier when you win, right? It's that's just the way it goes. It's like, yeah, no, we messed up here, here, but we still won. We still won. I mean, no matter how you win, a win's a win in the win column. Um, and they did a, Tremendous job doing that in Buffalo, make or not, excuse me, in Buffalo, in Colorado against the Buffs, making that statement. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I think that is on PJ, right? That's the one job of the coach is that clock management, and for him to mismanage that pretty poorly there. Um, I think it was good for him to stand up and own that. I mean, it shows his team leadership. Like, you know what? I make mistakes too, right? As a coach, I should have done better there. Um, so, I mean, and I, I'd like to think had they lost, he would have probably done the same thing, just knowing kind of PJ's rapport and how he wants to be perceived by his team and how he wants to take that leadership um, truly by the horns there. But yeah, it's everything's easier after when I would say I did terribly after a win too, because you're going to forget that I did terribly because we won. So there you go. And then when the loss happens, they go, yeah, but he took the blame for that other time. Yeah, so. right, exactly. You get a nice little check in the uh, I did good column. That's right. You're putting yeah. something in the bank right there. Um, <laughs> KG, we know that uh, PJ is a master of the mental game. So you talked earlier about you know Mike Zimmer and kind of the effect on, on his team. How does something like this play in the gopher locker room when your head coach stands in front of you and says, yeah, guys, you know what, I make mistakes too? Well, if you listen to what he has to say week in and week out, it's it's about accountability. And if you're truly going to be of that row the boat mentality, and if you're a kid in that locker room buying into everything he's saying is, you know, you're going to make mistakes. He talks about his players making mistakes and how that's all a part of, again, learning and getting better. And so for a head coach to to point that out and publicly apologize, I think it's a good thing. It is easier in a win than it is in a loss. But the bottom line is, um, whatever he's telling them, they're believing. And uh, I was taken back by how well they played on Saturday. Now, we don't fully know who Colorado is, but we saw them play a Texas A&M team who is very good and give them all they want. So it's a step in the right direction. The confidence they're going to gain from a win like this, any kind of win in Colorado, you would have gained confidence. But to go out there and 
manhandle a team like they did on Saturday, a quality football team. Uh, I don't think the PJ thing is even going to be near top of the mind for these kids. What they're going to feel right now is they're pretty damn good. And they're coming home to be a 31 point favorite this week. I don't want to say it's free money, but they're going to win. I mean, (laughs) they're going to win the game against Bowling Green. And now you're in a position, as we talked about a week ago, where if you win this game at Colorado, you get Bowling Green, now you have a good Big Ten season, you are in the conversation for New Year's Day football, and that is winning when you're a part of the Golden Gopher uh, football program. So stay with that, Jesse. I mean, you've got Bowling Green coming in. Okay, Jesus already guaranteed that you're going to win that game. It's homecoming. If you lay an egg, I mean, so so how much pressure is there on this coaching staff? Is there on this football team to make sure that that does not happen? I mean, a lot. Again, you go back to Miami of Ohio and how they barely snuck out that win, right? That says a lot. If you look at a team that can't beat these teams that should be very beatable, like your Bowling Greens, right? I mean, you want to win those games that you you should win. There's no question about that, especially to do it on homecoming as, you know, students and alums and everybody are there. I mean, you hate to let that home crowd down. You can feel that the kids will feel that. And that's hard for those, that team to, to carry that loss. I think on homecoming too. I know it sounds probably a little trite, but it is. I mean, that's such a big week and it's a celebratory time and a win really just puts the cherry on top. So I think to KG's points too, as you head in, you get this win, you're feeling extra good. You're on a roll. Now you've got three straight. You're just, you're feeling good heading into a very tougher competition wise uh, in the big 10. So it is pretty much a must win. Well, just when you think we've exhausted the self-blame game, let's head back to Arizona and Sunday and Joseph's late kick. Paul Allen, longtime radio voice of the Minnesota. Folks went after PA pretty hard on social media, but Allen stood up and took it like a man saying, I thought he made it and I didn't wait for the ref to signal no good. Today, I didn't, and I got burned. L on my behalf, no doubt. Uh, Jesse, who's someone, uh, someone whose brand is on the rise, do you accept public negativity as coming with the territory? Or as a society, have we just crossed the line when it comes to civility? I mean, it's a little bit of both, right? And unfortunately, people that are more in the public eye, like the three of us and, and many of your panelists, it comes with the territory. I've certainly had negative things tossed my way very few though thankfully everybody out there i love you all my followers are very nice um and you have i have a lot of good support including you guys around me too that that always help however that being said we're all still human no matter how publicly faced we are i mean pa still is human he's still gonna make mistakes and unfortunately i think social media does almost just a very terrible job of being kind of a cesspool of negativity a lot of times. And people can hide behind their screens and sling insults and sling just kind of nasty comments that aren't necessary at all. I mean, again, PA made a mistake. He owned up to it. I mean, that's the best that you can do. Like, yep, sorry, I'm human. Whoops. I thought it was in. And if (laughs) there was another viral video that went around where a Vikings fan was cheering because he also thought it went in, right? I mean, it's not that crazy. We make mistakes. Um, You know, again, I think as public figures, yes, you take a little bit more of that on and say, okay, and try to let it be water off a duck's back. Um, But it still doesn't make it okay. You know, as, uh, as Greg Joseph's hat said, be kind. And uh, it's, it's much, much better world out there. That is the truth. Uh, KG. I mean, you, you know, the guy, we all feel like we know PA. He's got the radio (laughs) show. He's been here forever. He's a guy who wears his heart on his sleeve, but you know him, you work with him. You've heard him call countless races at the track. Just how good is Paul Allen at what he does? Yeah, I've worked with the guy for 21 years, and I've worked with a lot of really good broadcasters. He's as good as anybody I've been around. And what makes Paul Allen so special is he does wear his heart on his sleeve. And that passion he has for calling a race at Canterbury, which he's done 10,000 plus times, or calling that Viking game comes out in the broadcast. And I go back to that game at Arizona over a decade ago where the Vikings were knocked out of the playoffs. Was it professional? No. Did we love it? Absolutely we did. That's the Paul Allen I want. I don't want a robotic, a robotic call of the game. When I turn on KFN to listen to the Vikings, I turn it on to hear not just my friend. Take that friendship aside. I want to hear Paul's passion and his love for this team. And part of that is what happened on Sunday is his love of that team and his wanting that kick to be good and wanting to have that call forced him to make a mistake. I love him more now than I did before that mistake because that's the guy I want calling the game. And if you talk to almost every Viking fan, you know that's the guy they want calling the game too. 
he's the best they've ever had at that. And uh, you know what? He owned up to it. Social media is a cesspool. I agree with Jesse. But, you know, again, don't at me on this one either out there. <laughs> I love Paul Allen just the way he is, and I wouldn't change a thing. And I think this call will be legendary 10, 20 years down the road, and we'll love him more because of it. Yeah, it'll it'll get play and NFL films and all the rest of it because of exactly what you said. Here, here's a guy, here's a guy, and you just feel the pain. All of us were feeling at that same moment, right? It was a professional, but you know, he talks about his process, but you know what? He is what he is, and and uh, we're better off for it. All right, you guys, I want to throw a few hot takes at you if if I can. And, and of course, Jesse Pierce, uh, you tell me that that's media day uh, tomorrow and camp begins the next day. So I got to ask. Here we Where go. Where are we on the Capril Caprizov situation? I don't know. I think Gorg and I are going to have to get our tickets to Siberia and go uh, shake some sense into some people over in that area. I mean, we're nowhere. I know Michael Russo of The Athletic had tw- or responded to a tweet, rather, saying that he believes that Kaprizov will be signed by next week. Um, still doesn't mean that he will be here for camp because, again, as we have talked about on the show, uh, he's got work visas to get to. He's got quarantine that has to be taken care of. So, I mean, it's still a little bit out before Kaprizov will actually be able to join the team and become a part of the Minnesota Wild. Again, you got to hope it happens soon, but I think both um, are very still holding strong in their places. Bill Guerin, as I've mentioned, is not a guy that particularly likes to be strong-armed. Um, so I think he's very set in what he wants to do. He also loves to convey that he's not worried about it. I know Wild fans, of course, have hit the panic button about a month ago about on this. Uh, but Guerin seems to still believe that things are okay. Negotiations are still going okay. So that should give you uh, Wild fans a little bit of faith. been over there to to talk to personally individually so i'm i'm taking everything that i that jesse says and what everybody what i see and what i remember of him as a player and watching his, his track record you know so this is a very important moment for him you know and how he handles this whole thing he's got a message he's sending to the rest of the team to the wild community and he has so far been sort of the steady hand on the wheel uh, Kevin Gorg, I know you have to go over there, so I don't want to say too much. I mean, I'm a guy who once got a Viking tried to beat me up in the locker room because, you know, I want, I said I thought he needed to be a little bit more consistent, you know? So Probably did. Another, well, uh, so, yeah. that was another, so I don't want to say anything that's going to get you in any, any hot water, but at the same time, just your, your take on, on how Garen has handled this uh, from, a, from a public relations standpoint, where, where the wild faithful are concerned. Well, to Jesse's point, knowing Bill Guerin as well as I now do since he got hired here, I don't think he cares. I, I, I don't. I think I think he knows what a Stanley Cup winner looks like, feels like, and smells like. He's done it as a player. He's done it as an assistant GM. And the most important thing to him is what's right for the team and what's the message to the team as the players. And no one man is more important than the group. And I think that's the message I get Every time I see Bill Guerin is everybody has a role to play. Everybody's vital. Everybody's important. So the reason he's not freaking out is he understands that no one man is, is greater than the mass of all the parts. And so he's he's made his offer. He ain't backing down. Uh, I agree with Jesse. If you know one thing about Bill Guerin is he's got no bluff to him whatsoever. He is going to hold firm to what he believes in. And this is on Kirill and more importantly, Kirill's agent. And there's a track record here. We all know it. We've all seen it. Um, and the offer the Wild have made, if you really look around and talk to people throughout the league, and there's been a lot of conversation with other GMs and other people that do this for a living, the offer's more than fair. So it comes down to whether the kid wants to be a hockey player or wants to set out and be a business person. And if he's got the wrong agent, that's on him. And as much as we love 97, he's got to get this thing figured out because watching him and just seeing last year play out, there sure seems to be a lot of enjoyment uh, of being around his teammates, being around the rink, and playing the game he loves. And right now, he's not being allowed to do that. And I think money's getting in the way. And at some point, he's got to look that agent in the eye and say, I need to play right now. So let's get this done and move on. Yeah, I'd love to know how much is him and how much is agent because I just I just don't understand the game that they're playing. But uh, hopefully, this is all resolved. He's here. We can all breathe and we can watch <laughs> the effect that he has because I don't look at this from a standpoint of, oh, I'm worried about time he'll miss in camp. 
I worry about the time everyone else misses not being with him on the ice because he sees the game differently. He plays the game differently. And I think, I hope you guys would agree with me that we just saw everybody on that team, their level just last year when he was doing what he was doing. Oh, without question. I mean, he definitely, I mean, Matt Zuccarello, you knew he was a good player coming in, but he rose to the occasion. Victor Rask, I know everyone gives Victor Rask a hard time, but nobody saw him being that center. But that's not happening without Kaprizov. Kevin Fiala raised his element because he knew he wanted to keep up. I mean, literally every single player, wouldn't you say, Gorgi? Yeah, and that's the hard part for me is, you know, you've got a lot of new faces in there. And I'll start with Marco Rossi, and we don't know where Rossi's going to land, how much uh, time he'll get with the big club right off the hop. He may have to start in Iowa. We don't know. Um, he's looked good so far um, with the younger guys out there, but you certainly at training camp would have wanted to see at least a chance of him playing uh, with Kaprizov. Is there chemistry? Do they see the game the same way? Is there potential down the, down the road for this guy to be a number one center? Because I think in the back of Bill Guerin's mind and his wild fans go, everybody's thought about it and dreamt about it. If this kid's that good, he might be able to play that role. And no disrespect to Victor Rask, but this kid has a, a much deeper uh, set of tools. So it could bring out the, the, the better part of the skills in Kaprizov. So again, it's, it's, it's all negative right now until they get him in there. It's going to happen. I believe that, uh, but uh, we don't, we don't know when, and that's the hard part. All right, Jesse Pierce, before we hear a third cry, I'm going to cut you <laughs> loose. Where should people look for your stuff? Uh, we just released our latest episode this week of Bardown Beauties with head coach Dean Ebsen. He had some really good insight. In fact, insight on to how he's approaching training camp without 97. Uh, so be sure to take a listen to that. He also talks about his lookalike creed from the office. A very, very fun episode. Highly recommend it. Um, and then on Twitter at Jesse Pierce, J-E-S-S-I underscore Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E. And uh, on here weekly. So I like it. And uh, Kevin Gord, anything besides the uh, the wild tomorrow? Well, no, just getting ready for the season at Gorgomatic 21. Uh, we'll have lots of uh, cool stuff from training camp this week. Maybe get some inside information on the status of Kaprizov. I'll pass that on if I can. Uh, just looking forward to, to another season with Valley Sports and covering this team. I think this year, uh, once they get all the pieces in place, there's going to be a lot of cool storylines. A lot of new faces, a lot of young players like Boldy and Rossi, where they fit in, Kalen Addison. Can the goaltenders come back and build off what they did last year? You've got the veteran in Talbot and the youngster in Kacken. And so, no, it's all positive right now. Looking forward to it. And then, of course, every morning outside of Wednesday at 830, we do our uh, programmatic show with all the point spreads and props. All right, you guys. I'm going to put in a final word, but I'm going to cut you guys loose. So, Jesse, you can go take care of business. Thank you both so much. You guys are the absolute best in the business, okay? Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Tim. All right. All right, we're going to close it down with what I'm calling Tim's take. As a young broadcaster, I was late getting to the set one night at WKBT-TV in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I had a five-minute five minute sports cast ahead of me. And I ran down the hall, and I ran on the set, and I put on my mic, and I started to do the sports, and you know what? I could not catch my breath. And the more I tried, the more I struggled, the worse it got till I started to hyperventilate and flop sweat and everything else. I was on live TV. I had five minutes to fill and I had nowhere to go. If social media existed back then, I would have been immortalized as that guy. And perhaps my broadcasting career never gets outside La Crosse, Wisconsin. Guys, people make mistakes. Bad things happen. It's always easy to find fault or kick somebody when they are down. You know what else is easy? Empathy. Just put yourself in their situation and let it go. Because who knows? Maybe next time, it might be you who needs to step up and take the blame. I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank my guests, obviously, Jesse Pierce and Kevin Gord. And a reminder that coming up this morning at 11, we're going to be live streaming the latest Let's Play Super Draft, where we take you inside what we believe is the future of daily fantasy sports. I want to thank you for joining us. Big thanks to my panelists and, of course, my good friends at Northern Lids for being the official hat provider of Let's Play Every Day in the Let's Play Sports Network. And if anybody asks, guys, it was my fault. I did it. It was mine. Thank you for engaging with Let's Play Every Day. 
You can find more episodes of Let's Play every day at www.letsplaysportsnetwork.com. Also on the Let's Play Sports Network Facebook page, Twitter account, YouTube channel, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Please rate us if you liked the program, as that's how we find and build an audience and can bring you more great options from the Let's Play Sports Network. Thanks for joining us, and remember, let's play every day. Let's play every day.